Flight 15 of the Bowers Pony. This flight was supposed to be simple, but then a hydraulic problem led to an engine problem, led to a whole bunch of work having to be done by Chase, and the result was still a puddle under the airplane. Now we've been getting a lot of good feedback on the internet. People are happy with the long briefs and the long debriefs and all the technical information we've been trying to pack into each one of these. Thank you for that. So we tried to do the same thing on this one. Let us know how we did. Give us feedback in the comments. If you saw something we didn't see, please let us know. In the meantime, hit that like button, subscribe, and saddle up because here comes Flight 15 of the Bowers Pony. I don't think the gear's moving. When he passed over, they were stuck. They were stuck. They were stuck. I can't tell what's going on down there. It's gonna leak, get it leaky for me. Definitely backfiring. Coolant's getting hot. Nothing's bent. And we have a small leak, a really small one. Yeah, it doesn't like the low power settings. I do. Looks like maybe two cylinders fell off. That nose camera fell off, we walk out of this with nothing. This isn't a COVID bug. <laughs> Quick shout out to our sponsors. Big thank you to Method 7 for their continued support and to Butler Parachute uh, for providing the best parachute in the business. In the meantime, uh, thank you to our recent uptick in Patreon supporters. Uh, this is a new thing for us, but we absolutely appreciate the support and thank you for taking the time. It absolutely helps us do what we do. Mycelia Municipal Airport. Automated weather observation. One, nine, zero, eight, Zulu. Wind variable at zero, three. Visibility, one, zero. Sky condition, clear. Temperature, two, four. Celsius, dew point, zero, nine, Celsius. Altimeter, three, zero, zero, zero. Remark. Municipal Airport. Automated weather observation. One, nine, zero. Yeah, they got it, Bobby. Yeah. What have you guys been up to since I was last year? Well, we addressed the uh, uh, part of the play in the stick. The next thing uh, is that the um, inner gear doors had remained open on landing and did not retract. We went in and found uh, the culprit on the P1 valve and the two uh, hydraulic cylinders for retracting the inner gear doors had the, the seals, uh, the hydraulic seals had failed because of overpressure situation. So we basically fixed those and uh, re refilled uh, the hydraulic uh, reservoir. Uh, we powered the, put the airplane up on stands and reduced the pressure from um, 1350 down to 950. That turned out to be a little bit too low, but uh, we jacked it so because it wouldn't fully retract the gear properly. So we jacked the pressure up to 1,050. Is that correct? Yep. And, and that just solved the problem. So now it works really good. The sequencing works really good now on it. 
We also replaced a suspect uh, number uh, 10 or number 12 90 degree fitting, which is a scavenge fitting at the, at the very front of the oil pan, which is right near the, uh, where the flywheel is. Got anything to add to that? No, we've test run the heck out of the airplane and can't duplicate a leak. Yeah. So either A, fixing that fitting has resolved oh. it, or B, the attitude of the airplane taxing around is all we can duplicate. We, we put the black light dye yes. in, the main, in, the, in the engine only, not in the engine and the PSRU. We just, that way we could isolate whether the oil uh, will react uh, you know, to the black light, and then we, we'd know whether it was the engine oil or not. It's important that we isolate where this oil is coming from because yep. if it is from the rear seal or the oil pan, we need to know that and we need to know the volume that's coming out. If it's a minor leak, fine, but if it's, it's still a major leak, we've got to pull the engine again. And, you know, we're basically trying to prevent having to do that. We want to know for sure what we're up against. Yeah. We want to know for sure, is it an engine oil leak? Is it a rear main seal? Is it an oil pan or is it a PSRU leak? Instead of just taking an item off, thinking, okay, well, this has got to be the area, hit it, replace this gasket, or go through all that work and didn't change the darn thing. We need to diagnose this problem and find out what is causing this issue. So that's mm -hmm. what this flight today, get it. If it's going to leak, get it leaky for me. Okay. <laughs> so brief mission overview, it's a leak check flight. So we're going to try to get the engine hot, get the nose down. Uh, but we're doing all this uh, rigmarole to get airborne anyway, so there's no reason to make it too fast, especially if we have airborne chase. Uh, so the plan is to uh, start here. The question there was whether or not uh, we were going to try to taxi around the construction that you'll see in a second, or whether we were going to tow the airplane out to the taxiway and start there. Confirm, yep. I got a knock. Yeah. Okay, come start here. We're going to go around the corner and we taxi out. Justin's going to meet me out here on the main taxiway where they two come together. Okay, uh, you're going to lead us out down okay. to the run-up area. Um, and you're just going to go. So you're going to meet me at 7,000. So you're okay. going to call. Last time was what, 4,000 was when, when I went. Something yeah, like that. seems to work out well. We'll do that again. We didn't have any issues with, uh, with engine temps sitting on the ground, so that should all work. And um, we'll do all that comms on CTEF. I'm going to take off. We're going to go upstairs, uh, meet hopefully around 6 or 7, something like that. We'll hang out for 15 minutes and then do a normal RTV landing. You'll chase the descent as well. Uh, since you're going to be in the cockpit, you'll have a camera, there's no reason not to film. But the big thing, the priority is that you're there to make sure that if it's leaking, it's not scary, or you can help us make those yeah, calls, walk you through. which allow us to, to stretch out the length of this flight a little bit, yeah. since there is some risk of leaks. We talked about the maintenance and ER status inside. Is there anything that you didn't cover yet? No. Anything you uh, remembered since then? Everything is transparent. Okay. Uh, we're full of gas. Yes. Full of gas. We've got plenty of gas. I'm going to plan to, uh, for a fuel plan, I'm just going to stay on the left tank all day. Uh, if anything happens, we'll have a full right bag that we can use as well. Uh, so we're going to get suited up. You can't see me when I'm sitting in the engine, so once we break here, we we'll assume we're just going to go right direct. You'll be able to hear it when it starts, and then you'll start. Yep. Sounds right. So here's an example of some of the stuff you can't control, right? So uh, the gentleman on the lawn tractor, uh, where nobody was really sure who told him what to do, so we're all kind of just trying to stay out of the way. It turns out that he thought the airplane needed to be towed past the construction that I had already mentioned. And so he kind of went and got his tractor, showed up, and then uh, everybody's just trying to figure out who's... We've had problems in the past on this program with uh, not having a clear person who's in charge at any given time. And this is a great example where nobody knew if he knew how to tow the airplane, where the airplane was supposed to be towed, all the things, uh, and uh, at the very least interrupted the brief uh, a little bit deeper, uh, could have uh, risked the airplane safety. So looking back on it, I take it as action item, something I could have done better if, uh, if I would have just stopped him, shut the tractor down, we could have all had a circle up, make sure everybody was on the same page about who he was, did he know how to tow the airplane, why was he doing what he was doing, uh, the airplane would have been safer, the brief would have been more productive, it would have been a less of an interruption, and we would have been overall more efficient for the day. So uh, I'll, I'll take that up myself. So uh, we'll both get started. You'll hear me start, then you'll start. And then you want to pull forward and do thumbs up, or you just want to wait and just, see me go? Uh, when I see you go, I'll go. And then we'll meet around here where the two taxiways yep. come together. You'll take the lead and we'll right turn there. the corner. Yeah. Okay. Then you're going to go as soon as you get done with your run-up. Because we're worried about the hydraulics, I'm going to be watching the hydraulics on taxi out. Yeah. And then um, as far as after takeoff checks, we're worried about does running the engine change the hydraulic pressure? And then does being airborne or perhaps an airborne retraction? At what point does the pressure change from whatever it is? sitting here in the chocks. So we're trying to get some recording on that. 
Chase procedures, you're going to stay in that 45 degree cone behind the airplane once we get uh, picked up at six or 7,000 feet. If you want to do lead changes or anything, we'll brief all that. Uh, we talked frequencies already. Uh, we need to make sure you get frequencies. So it'll be 7,000 feet overhead for 15 minutes and then RTB, so plan on using 3-0 on the way back in. Cool. And then it's a normal landing, taxi back. Do you want me to taxi around the corner back into here? No. Okay. So we'll shut down Yeah. right here. And you're going to shut down in the same spot? Uh, yeah. Uh, 250 mile an hour is the uh, speed limit. G's no more than 2.5. Bailout altitudes, I'm going to use 3,000 uh, AGL. So we'll just call that 4,000 uh, MSL. If I'm on fire or out of control fighting the airplane through 4,000, you're going to keep me honest on that. Okay. Uh, emergency procedures. The big one is emergency extension since we've been messing with the hydraulic system. So that's going to be uh, just move the lever to the down position. That's down going to relieve all the locks. Off. Correct. And make sure we get down lights. Yep. And then we're clear to land. Mm -hmm. Okay. Around the room. Do you have anything else? Anything else? Good. Good. Uh, we'll just get ground crew there to see Taff and then we'll them. Do you have any questions for uh oh, yeah. All right, you go. All right, I'll get this one. I'll get one. Okay, I got a piece for you. Perfect. Sorry, Javik, that's A1452, departing runway 30 straight out, departure. Vector, Javik, we're on to 131, Army Golf, line up runway 30, it will be a uh, rough climb of, over the airport of Vector. Flight Tiger, Javik, Seneca, 32959, 3 miles north. So as an example of uh, missed communication, uh, that call from Justin was uh, Chase is at 5,500. So from my seat, what I heard was Chase is at an altitude. I didn't hear the number. So therefore, I was thinking he was descending out of 4,000 to come and meet me when in fact he had climbed 1,500 feet since I did brake release. So what he was really doing was asking if he should come down and help or should he stay at 5,500 and I was uh, had too much of a helmet fire to notice that. And confirming gear handles in the up position. All my breakers look good. Got an inner gear door open light. So again, speaking to that missed uh, communication opportunity, you can see there I'm tightening up the cockpit because in my mind, I'm waiting for Justin, right? There's there's no rush. The airplane is relatively stable. I want Justin to take a look at the belly so we don't miss the opportunity to learn what's going on with the gear. But meanwhile, he's up at altitude waiting for me to tell him to come down and help. Okay, I am uh, downwind to beam, 3-0. Still they got enough power to hold altitude. Just had a rudder trip change. So there's two calls there. First was a position call to help with uh, Justin's rejoin. And the second was uh, uh, continuing to diagnose what's going on with the bottom of the airplane. I'm talking about this directional stuff that I'm feeling underneath the airplane. The position call ended up being a cue to Justin that I did want him to descend, which he immediately uh, confirms, which then uh, starts his descent. Down, how to pick you up? Yep. Down. 
So on this communication issue, we get a lot of offers to help with Chase, right? There's a lot of perception uh, in the community that the job of a Chase pilot is simply just to fly formation. Fly formation is certainly a required skill, but really what's important is this, this very tight communication between the Chase pilot and the test pilot. So in this case, Justin and I fly together all the time. There's nobody on the planet I've flown more test sorties with. And here's an example of a very simple miscommunication that costs us valuable seconds. In this case, we had the time, but in some cases you don't have the time. And that's why there's so much more to chase flying than simply formation flying. So a quick overview on the hydraulic system in the uh, Stuart Mustang. First of all, it's an electrically driven hydraulic pump. Second of all, this airplane is modified. So uh, not only are there up locks and down locks, but there's a electronic sequencer that's been added to the system. As Rod and Eric briefed uh, on the previous flight, we had overpressurization that had failed a couple of the actuators in the belly. And then because of that, they rebuilt those actuators, but they'd also turned down the pressure in the system. So on this flight, from my perception in the cockpit, so I know that I've moved the gear handle, which has mechanically unlock the down locks. I know that something has moved in the bottom uh, because I saw the ear, inner gear door light come on. Uh, so I know that there was at least enough pressure to unlock the inner gear doors. The question was, uh, did something blow up? Did we blow a bunch of hydraulic fluid out? Or all the, is the gear down at the bottom just hanging barely unlocked? Or has the gear sucked most of the way up and we just have simply a low pressure tied with relatively high airspeed uh, problem? So in most cases, after a failed retraction, I would simply put the gear handle back to the down position. Even if there was no hydraulic pressure, the gear would gravity fall into position and I could wiggle the rudder to get the uh, uh, gear past the down locks. But since we had airborne chase, uh, we had the opportunity to get more information, right? So in the event that that nose camera that we run underneath the, the snout of the Mustang had failed, we could land and not have any information about what had happened except for what I remembered and what was captured on the GoPros at the cockpit. So since we had chase, we could put Justin in position relatively easily to see what's going on in the belly. So in the event that uh, you know, if the, the day gets much worse, the airplane ends up on its belly, we would have more data to know what had happened. So we're back at that moment where Justin is confirming that I want him to come down and do the pickup. Coming down, downhill to pick you up. Yep. Coming down. I'll tell you, traffic's here at 24665. We'll clear the area give you time to get down. Thanks, sir. So this is something we've never experienced before this flight. This is other pilots in the area purposely distancing themselves from the Visalia Airport where our emergency was going on. It's a great example of uh, why we use CTAF. Uh, for as many communications as we can because it gives us and other aircraft in the area such better essay as to what's going on so we can all coordinate around each other. And I'm holding this configuration for you. That'll be I'm at your uh, 2 o'clock high, to 4,500. Big right turn coming. I do. Cool, it's getting hot. I do. So again, on the topic of time, right? Uh, when the gear had not immediately come up, the normal procedure would have been to drop the gear. Because we had Chase, the thought was, let's bring Chase on board and get all the information we can. So at this point, with the gear partially retracted, covering this coolant scoop on the bottom of the airplane, the engine temperatures are starting to go up. With that, our timeline is getting condensed, right? So at this point, I made the decision to try a pitch bunt. Uh, rather than holding the airplane in a stable position to try to get Justin on, on board to understand what's going on, I made the decision to attempt a pitch bunt in order to try to get the gear retracted, in order to get the engine cooled down before we had an engine-related emergency. So here comes that pitch bunt, a little bit of a pull, and then a push, and then from the outside of the airplane, pull, and then push, there goes the gear, and then goes the inner gear, gear door cycling, boom, and boom. Copy all, I just did a pitch whoop de doo that seemed to work. So here's a cockpit detail shot. I'm just zooming in on the over-the-shoulder camera, that's this angle here. Things of note, these are the gear position lights on the upper left eyebrow. So the gear is not down and locked. On the right side of the panel, you can see the hydraulic pressure gauge. This is a mechanical steam gauge, and it's currently indicating 600 PSI. Of note, the system was set to 1050 before this flight. And the inner gear door open light. Uh, since it's lit in this case, you can tell the inner gear doors are open. On the PFD, you can see the turn uh, slip ball indicator. Uh, which will be a good indication of that uh, changing directional situation as the gear retracts. And lastly, the airspeed uh, airspeed of note 130 is the recommended uh, gear retraction speed. So here comes the bunt and pull and push. You see the ball slice right, then left. Watch the pressure regulate. Inner gear door light goes out, more regulate, and then finally 800 PSI. Now with the gear retracted, the engine can cool and we have time. 
So time for Justin to get on board, time for us to diagnose what happened and what could potentially happen when we throw the gear out, uh, when it's time to land. Uh, as soon as we start extending the gear, getting the flaps out, pulling the power back, getting down low, all that, uh, that uh, anxiety comes back. So it's important to take this moment to learn all that we can. Gears up, I think. Copy, we're at your uh, 4 o'clock. Uh, it's about to uh, be flying. Got a lot of smash on you. Understood, I'll lower the nose, give you all I got. Cool, it's uh, reverse to trend, almost under 200 degrees. Roger, we're almost on board. I don't know if that was another gear coming up or what. Just got some turbulence in the bottom. Yeah, that's a turbulence. Let's keep the right turn coming. That'll be right turn. Yeah, I can't tell what's going on down there. All right, we're coming on board. I'm going to turn back for the airport. And this way. The wheel is clean, doors are up. Mains are clean, doors look up. Yeah, you're the clean to me. Okay, pressure is indicating, but it's low. Uh, showing 600 PSI. Yeah, it looks like we've got a little bit of a leakage on the right door as well. I saw you traffic. Glitter 1 is on a uh, left downwind, runway 30. I saw traffic on downwind. Where are you at now? We are uh, about, uh, let's see here, about three and a half miles to the south. Copy all the airport towers. Coming up on downwind to beam, I've got to change in engine roughness. Copy. So on top of everything else that was going on that day, it was also the highest density altitude we'd flown at in a while. So yes, we'd messed with the engine. Yes, we were thinking about whether or not the engine was going to have a problem on this flight. But independent of that, all this droning around don't down low at weird power settings with the mixture full rich as we diagnosed the problem uh, in the high density air was actually loading up the plug. So as soon as I pulled the power back to land, uh, the engine starts running rough and we think, oh great, now we're having an engine failure on top of everything else. Let's slow down for the gear. Temps and pressures are all good. Looks like maybe two cylinders fell off. Copy. Low gear speed, gear's coming down. Good gear, that's fair. Definitely backfiring. Got the two mains down and the tailwheel, the inner doors are closed. Okay, I've got three green lights in here. Hydraulic pressure uh, just under 1100, so that looks like it should be. Approach speed looks good. A little bit more rev seemed to clear up the cylinders. They came back. Engine set up for the go-around, 4,000 RPM. Of note, the uh, hydraulic pressure is now at uh, 1050. It looks like you got three solid gear. Yeah, it doesn't like the low power settings. I would assume it's a mixture problem, but I'm not going to deal with it now. Laps coming. Bye, sell you traffic. Glitter 1, it's final, 3-0. I told you traffic to Hackman at 643 Hotel, about 8 miles to the northwest and down to Crown Hill at midfield left down on 3 by Delia. Oh, at 5 feet, 3 feet, 2 feet, 1 foot. And that's good. Okay, we're going to go to 1450 Sierra 5 North. 1,500, be maneuvering 2,000 below the next one, five minutes, right there. And glitter one is down and safe for anybody that's listening. Right there, Travis, that's May, 145, Sierra 5, North, 1,500, be maneuvering 2,000 below the next one, five minutes, right there. Cool, good flight, man. Thanks for coming along. Well, it's always a trade-off between letting him work the problem, figure out what's going on, yeah, and, like no, I, giving him information, right? And that's my first time having to deal with that. Yeah, so. no, it's all good. He did great. Yeah. So I select to gear up right after takeoff normal. I got the inner gear door light and a low voltage light, so that all seemed normal. And then it just, you know, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting for them. You can always hear them hit yeah. the bottom. And I don't hear it, I'm like, okay. So my gut was, so there was just enough pressure to unlock the uh, inner doors and they dropped and then that was it. And that was all that we had got out of my selecting gear up. Uh -huh. So you come screaming downhill and I'm waiting just because, you know, we can, if that ca nose camera fell off, we walk out of this with nothing if we don't stop and wait for a second, right? Yep. Cylinder, uh, oil temp, or water temp, water temp was rising, but it wasn't stupid yet. Like, we got a second, let's take our second, right? Right. So you, he comes screaming down just before you got there, he made his call that said that the gear was hung or whatever, and I'm thinking about it, it must might be hung. So I just did like a little push on the on the stick, 
Mm -hmm. I hear them hit. So they might have been like part way up and. So that's what he says that just the wheel was out, just the very bottom oh. was out. So we probably need to adjust the, the pressure, the hydraulic pressure a little more. Does that jive with the directional stuff too, you think? Yeah, so I think it was in there, you know, that thing, that last little bit of door, it makes huge drag differences, right? Especially as it's the yeah, angle small, yeah, right. And so I think that's what was going on. Um, so then we're in that moment where we have temps are coming under control, gears up. Now, do we want to go fly to Barstow? Probably not, but like before, Anything else we do is going to make this less happy. It's going to be a less stable situation. So uh, we talked a little bit about it, decided the RTB, uh, threw the gear out, and right about then, the engine started getting really pissed off. So it looked like one, maybe two cylinders fell off. There's really? a bunch of rough running associated with that. If I gave a little bit of power, that helped. It would clear it, but it, it was not happy. Okay. We covered a bunch of stuff out there. It's probably best to just back up and go through it all again. Taxied out. Uh, we talked about that on the radio. Decided we were going to go. Got down to the run-up area. Um, you did your run-up and went. We did our run-ups about the same time, and then you went. I stayed in the in the uh, old short or in the yeah. run-up area. Yeah, it was a little bit uh, confusing me whether or not we we're going to try to tr troubleshoot more, but then you were doing the run-up, so I just went. Yeah, so I could have done better there. There was a moment where I was like, did I make a clear call to Justin? No, as soon as I heard the power come up. What's up? As soon as I heard the power come up, I was like, oh, we're going. Okay. So no, no worries. Okay. So then uh, you went. There was more traffic than usual. There were guys backed up back there. So I just stayed in the run-up area and let them taxi for me. I had to tell one girl to go past them. But everybody else sort of figured it out that I was just going to hang out. So all that stuff worked. Um, during the run-up, uh, I was looking at the mechanical tack, the analog tack. Uh, it's indicating low by a factor of two. So I think it's a counter thing on that. And that probably is, into, is why below 2,000 it doesn't work because there's no resolution below 1,000 RPM. Okay. So that's my gut. Now say again on the TAC. The analog TAC, I think it's counting one pulse versus two pulses or two pulses versus four pulses or whatever. Yeah, yeah, I think it's two pulses. So it's indicating uh, 1,200 RPM when the engine's making 2,400 RPM on the other TAC. It's, so I think that's the problem. Yeah, good, good fine. And um, that, that's a, that doesn't go through the EIS, so. Yeah. No, I don't, I don't know. No, we'll it, we'll figure it out. It doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. It's yeah. a counters, counter thing, okay. which I think might be the whole issue Yeah. overall. Uh, so you took off. You were doing your climbs. Um, whatever, that one girl went off in front of me. That was all fine. Then um, you called 4100 right as I crossed the uh, old short line. Added power to go. Uh, power came up real nice. I was able to hit uh, 42 almost right on the nuts, and I was just a little, I was like 100 RPM off on the revs. So I got that set, and then I was airborne. Gear handle to the up position, and um, I saw the inner gear door light come on. I saw the low voltage light come on. I was like, okay, things are happening. And that's why I'm kind of going over you at that point. And then I leveled the wings, and about that time by then, I should have heard kunk, kunk, and I'm not hearing it, right? So then start, start my turn to head off and say, I think we got a gear issue. You said um, the low voltage light came on? It did come on. It did come on. Um, then you came, You made your calls that you were screaming downhill. So the point we we're talking about there, right? So I'm just turning on the downwind right here. If I'd been by myself, the handle would have gone right back to down. We just would have come in and landed. There's no more data to get. We would have got whatever you got or you videotaped or whatever as far as where the gear position was. So we had Justin Airborne. It seemed like a chance to take another look. Yeah. So it was uh, right turns. We did like a 360, two 360, something like I think that. It was but you one, got, on, yeah. got on board. Took a look at the belly. Before, while I was waiting for you to come downhill, I'm flying the downwind this way. I'm sitting there thinking about it. You made your call. You're like, uh, gear was part way up. So my assumption was that the inner gear doors had opened and the door gear had become unlocked, but so they would be kind of down here. And his comment was that they were kind of up here. And I was like, okay, something's working, right? Yeah. So my gut was that the pressure was just too low to get that last bit. Yeah. So that what happens if I do a bunt? So I did a bunt and choo, 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 I hear him hit, right? Okay, so now his system's up. By this time, coolant's up to 220 degrees. Yeah, because the doors are still. It's up. not stupid, right? Yep. And that's yep. why we, we still had time. Yep. And then lots of time, we had time, right? 220 degrees, as soon as it hit the upwells, you could see it fall off, right? We're almost back down to 200 by the time you guys got aboard. I think it was like 205, something like that by the time you guys Sounds got aboard. Mm -hmm. uh, you pulled in, said everything looked like it was up and tight. We talked about whether or not it made sense to complete the card since we had everything 
under control, right? The coolant temperatures are coming under control. Yep. We're in a condition yeah. where we can climb, we can hang out for 20 minutes. The point I was trying to make on the radio was I didn't want to hang out. If we're going to hang out, that's fine, or we can talk about that. But I don't want to hang out at the altitude we're at. We're going to yep. climb or we're going to land. But I'm done hanging out at this altitude. It's just the wrong spot to be, especially on that part of the air. I understood that. Okay. And um, you made the comment, or you made the comment that he had called the RTB. Let's just honor that. So that's what we did. Got onto downwind. Because um, um, gear is such a high drag item on it, I waited pretty late in the downwind. So downwind to beam is where I tried to throw the gear out on this thing. I waited even probably a little bit past that to throw the gear out. In order to do that, you know, I'm back on the power because clean, it's kind of hard to get going that slow. And once you're back that far on the throttle, it's uh, popping and banging. I look down and two EGTs have fallen off. When I look back, only one had fallen off, so you have to check the recorder. I was able to get the recorder to stand up, but it's different. The whole menu system is different. I don't know if you did an upload or something, but I couldn't find the page. It took me a while to find it, and it took me a while to turn it off. But I started it before I took off, and I shut it off after I landed, but before the shutdown. So all the data should be there. One or two cylinders fell off. Now, we've had this problem before with this engine, right? If you're way back on the power, and there's a lot of rev, the fuel ratios aren't perfect, whatever. So it's, maybe it's not anything. But at this moment, I'm thinking like, yeah, no, I, yeah. I'm thinking, I just threw the gear out. I'm super high drag. I got a motor that may not be happy. Let's just get this thing. I'm pretty well done with this thing. So I waited on the flaps till actually most of the way on to final. That would be great. And it helped me yeah. in the turn to final. For, like I was right there the whole turn. So thank low you. Low voltage light ever go out? I never saw the low voltage light again. You say you never saw it go I out? just saw it flash a couple times during the retraction cycle. Just a couple little flashes. Not like, Meh! and then scream for the rest of the flight. That's not what I saw. Just like it must have tucked below when the gear was hanging there and the pump was working real hard or something. It was not on for the whole flight. So in other words, it's not a continuous issue. That's my understanding. Okay. And I think we're in a weird enough scenario on this flight with the pump that I would disregard low voltage for now. Um, touchdown was probably fast, um, but it was the most the nose has ducked after touchdown that I've ever experienced. And my thought was, do I have a brake problem here? And if so, am I going to be able to control this thing? It reminded me of the tailwind incident. It was like, I'm adding back pressure. I'm, back, I'm like, I'm about to run up out of up elevator, and at which point I'm not going to be able to stop this thing from getting the problem. So it could have been a fast touchdown, but it wouldn't hurt to take a look at the brakes. Yes. I don't think the tires are low, but I don't know. Fast touchdown, right? So the, the tail's already high. The moment's smaller than it would normally be because the CG's like right on top of the yeah. mains, right? And then you get all that drag and it could be more, right? It's higher spin loads because you're going faster. Right. All those things could be worse just because I just landed fast. We can look at the tape and see what speed I touched down at, but just so we're talking about yeah. it, it was the most I've ever seen the nose come down. Okay. Uh, shut off the data recorder, which I already mentioned uh, as I was getting off the runway. Came back in here um, for shutdown and it did the... Um, uh, full mixture to cut off at idle and sitting there motoring and it's not running right so then I stood the throttle up and that killed it. Um, that's all I have from my perspective. Anything from Chase? Lined up with everything I saw. I've got a friend named Don Danmeyer that talks almost as fast as you. <laughs> but you've got him beat by about a factor of two. <laughs> Thanks again for sticking around all the way here to the end of the video. We really appreciate all the uh, recent support uh, with our new style of videos. The comments and uh, all the feedback really helps us do what we do. It makes me feel like not only are we getting benefit out of it, but also maybe somebody out there is getting benefit from it as well. Again, big shout out to our sponsors, uh, Method 7 and Butler Parachute. Thanks, guys, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. I gotta catch a glimpse of these warlocks.